Thank you everyone for joining me once again. I'm your host, Emmanuel Mutui, and today I have an amazing guest. When I asked him to join the show, I honestly did not think I was gonna, he was going to say yes, just because he's a busy man. And when he said yes, I, I was the happiest little kid in, on the planet. <laughs> and our stories, they kind of intersect. We met when he moved here. We didn't see each other for a long time, and we are, we've reconnected. Reconnected. Yeah. And he's an amazing person, amazing worshiper. I met his wife. She's an amazing woman, too. He, everything about him and in the process of this interview, you'll see why I'm so excited about this interview. And without further ado, Brad Fontaine. Hey, thanks, man. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for being on the show. And before we start, I want him to pray for us so that we can start this interview off right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Father, we just thank you for all the incredible things that you're doing in us and through us. And Lord, you love relationships. And so, Father, I just thank you for connecting us and allowing us the opportunity just to share with each other and I encourage each other, and Lord, I just pray that as uh, as we share today, Lord, that there will be something that we say that just encourages people's hearts, it stirs them up to just go after you with everything that they have, God, that they will just pursue you and surrender everything to you, knowing that you can do better than they can do it on their own. So, Father, bless our time together, bless our words, and bless this man and all the things that he's doing for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's get this in the go. Yeah. So... Let's start from the beginning, because yeah. some people know who you are, some people don't. Yeah, a lot of people don't. Yeah. People don't. <laughs> when we met, we, I heard your accent, but that was it. So where are you from? Man, I, so I moved a lot when I was a kid. Okay. I'm from Virginia. Okay. Uh, and then um, moved here a few years ago from Texas, so I spent mm-hmm. a few years in Texas, but I'm yeah. from Virginia. Okay. That's where I went to high school. Nice. That's where me and my wife got married. Yeah. Um, so you're so Virginia kid. East Coast. Yeah. <laughs> Is that song Country Road? Yeah. Take Me Home? I don't know the words, but... <laughs> right. I, there's a lot of country songs. About it. <laughs> Virginia is a beautiful place. Uh, yeah. My family, uh, some of my family's still there. Some mm-hmm. of my family's in Florida now. My wife's family, all of her family are still yeah. in Virginia. So, so when you're coming up in Virginia, were you brought up in a Christian household or what was that like? I was. I was actually brought up. My parents were, uh, have been pastors, missionaries. Mm-hmm. Um, they've done a lot, of, a lot of missions work in different countries, China, Mexico, Africa, things like that. We actually lived in Haiti for a few months. Wow. When I was a, a child. I was about eight years old. We mm-hmm. lived there for a few months. Yeah. Um, so was raised in a, in a Christian home, Christian parents. Did this make you want to go into ministry or was it just something your parents did? Man, I, you know, I mean, when I was really little, I wanted to be a professional baseball player, you know, okay. <laughs> like, my, like most, most kids. Yeah. Uh, but I always, you know, ministry was just kind of part of who we were. And mm-hmm. so I always felt like that was probably a, yeah. be a part of what I was going to do. And, mm-hmm. um, how did it change from baseball to well, I'm not going to say what you do now because we're going to yeah. save that. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, uh, I just, I knew that I probably would mm-hmm. not be good enough to make it all the way to the pros, you know, yeah. in baseball. I mean, mm-hmm. I did love baseball and I was pretty good, but, mm-hmm. um, but man, I just, worship kind of was something that started when I was a kid, okay. uh, singing and stuff. And then once I really got started leading worship and experiencing yeah. those kinds of things and God opening up opportunities, mm-hmm. man, I just knew that's what I wanted to do that's awesome. uh, for, forever. So, and, or at least a part of what I wanted to do forever. And because I grew up in a Christian home and I've, a lot of people who grew up in a Christian home. My, parent, my dad was a pastor and whatnot. And the one thing is always overlooked is everybody assumes you're going to be a Christian because you're in a Christian home. Sure. And so from that, people always have different journeys. Some run away, come back later, we'll never come back. Some stay the path. How was your journey? Yeah, so I was a pretty straight-laced kid. Okay. Uh, I didn't do a lot of stupid stuff mm-hmm. until I went to college. Ah. Uh, so, yeah, through high school, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I went to a private a Christian school. My parents were incredible, mm-hmm. sacrificed to send me to a, a great Christian school. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had a great education. And yeah. then I got a scholarship to a school in North Carolina, actually, uh, to play soccer. Um, so I was really? playing soccer first. I love soccer. Uh, yeah, and so I went down there, and man, I, I made some stupid decisions. Where in you North know? Carolina? Uh, it was in uh, Murfreesboro, North Carolina. I just come, came back this weekend from Cornelius, North Carolina. Yeah, not not even sure where that is. Murfreesboro is very small. It's okay. a small school. So I went down there to play soccer, mm-hmm. and man, I just you know, I I was out of the house and you know did yeah. some stupid things and yeah, uh, and I, honestly, I didn't. 
mm-hmm. it didn't last very long. I was there for one semester, and I knew that I was not heading in the right direction. So yeah. decided to not go back the second semester. Yeah, refocus, mm-hmm. seek God. Could you see tell what us? Wanted me to do in that that moment where you're like, this is not where I need to be headed. What was that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, things were going great as far as soccer went. I had yeah. a great freshman year. Um, you know everything that I thought I thought I wanted to be a college athlete and just mm-hmm. you know I was getting to play is a lot of opportunities but man I just there was there was always a call of God on my life yeah God from a, from an early age mm-hmm. there was a call the God had had purposed yeah my life to to be for his glory and so um when I'm when I wasn't doing that when I yeah. was kind of running away from that you know there was just the foundation that my parents had put in me I just knew that mm-hmm. I I didn't want to continue in the path I was going that yeah. that my parents you know raised us to to love the Lord and to love the things of God and mm-hmm. um so I just knew that that wasn't the person I wanted to become and so yeah. I just decided to go back home. go back and get and yeah. and, and honestly uh I had kind of been so engulfed with mm-hmm. uh, some of the struggles and trials that I had that I knew I needed to change an environment. I needed yeah. to get out of there mm-hmm. and go get to a place that was going to help me okay. get healthy and get healed on, uh, from some things. So, so you go home, you go change home, your life. I regroup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then a friend of mine was going to Oral Roberts University in Your Tulsa, school. Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. So I went down to visit, and uh, while I was there, they actually had a worship night on a Sunday night. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was sitting, when I was standing there in the worship night, uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, I want you to come to this university. Mm. And so uh, I, I knew it was very expensive, and so I didn't know how yeah. that was going to happen. <laughs> you know, So I went, I went home. My parents were actually living in Colorado at the time, mm. Loveland, Colorado. So okay. I, I came back to Loveland and uh, told my parents, I said, I think God spoke to me to go to ORU. And so... Uh, we knew it was going to be a miracle, you know, mm-hmm. so we started just, uh, I applied and we started putting things out. And so through some scholarships and grants and stuff, I was able to get some of it paid for. Wow. And so I went down there and the friend that I had down there actually didn't even come back. So I, but when I went to RU, I didn't know anyone. <laughs> I didn't know anyone. Wow. And so when I got there, yeah. I actually had planned on, excuse me, trying to walk on the soccer team. Okay. okay. I wanted to see if I could walk on mm-hmm. and see if I could play soccer there. Uh, but I just so happened to get put on a floor with other guys that were part of the worship department. God. So Oral Roberts University, they have chapels. They had a you know, a 150 member choir. They had chapels every week, and wow. they had teams that traveled and things. So it was, it was like a church, you know, worship department. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the guys on my floor were in the worship department. Yeah. And so they started telling me about the tryouts for the choir, mm-hmm. and I had been singing you know, in church since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And so decided... And up at this point, yeah. the singing and you going to worship, were those two ever... Con- did you ever think you'd be doing worship? or? Yeah, I mean, the way I was raised, you know, you had the worship leader and stuff. I didn't really... That didn't really... I didn't want to do that, you know. Yeah. I, I did think about doing CDs and stuff okay. like that, making albums and all mm-hmm. that, CDs. Yeah. <laughs> back in the day. If you don't know what that is, you can Google it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> But back in the day, it used to be CDs. But uh-huh. yeah, so I, you know, I dreamed of doing that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I never thought about like pursuing yeah. you know, worship leading as a mm-hmm. as a career or okay. a, a calling. You know. Yeah. And so, so. So you try yeah. to do the so trials. I, I try for the choir. Mm-hmm. I make the choir, and so then from the choir, you you could there were some other opportunities where you could audition for some teams that travel mm-hmm. and things like that. And so I, I ended up doing that and ended up going on a missions trip, mm-hmm. uh, a worship missions trip. We went to, okay. to, L- to London yeah. for a month, and we sang mm-hmm. at different churches and led mm-hmm. worship. And yeah. then we went to California, the, the West Coast, sang at some different churches and stuff yeah. like that. So that was my real first experience mm-hmm. of, like, using my singing gift mm-hmm. to lead worship. When, was, when, did it, to, when did it click or when did you get a revelation that this is what you'll be doing? For so it wasn't until... Um, so I was singing on, I was singing the choir, okay. and I went on a trip, and then they actually had, uh, the president of the university at the time had a Christian television show, okay. and he had singers that would sing mm-hmm. on the program. This is his son, right? Uh, what's that? Or Robert's uh, Yeah, Richard, Richard Roberts was, yeah. was uh, the president, and so he had a show where he had singers that were singing. It was a scholarship, so if you were on that team, it, it helped pay for school. So I was asked to be a part of that, and That's so amazing. I did that. 
And then um, from there, I had the opportunity to, to travel on some mission trips with okay. uh, President Roberts. And so mm. I went to. I ended up going to the first trip I went to was to the Ivory Coast. Wow. And uh, I wasn't supposed to go. There was two other guys on the team that were mm-hmm. planning on going, and I was on my way to work. I was working at a restaurant, waiting tables. Yeah. And uh, and Richard's assistant called me and said, "Hey, would you like to go to Africa?" And I was like, "Are you kidding? Uh, yeah, I would love to go to Africa." <laughs> and so uh, she said, "Well, you need to get your shots." You know. So yeah. the next day, I went and got shots, mm-hmm. and then a few weeks later. I'm yeah. flying to Africa. Wow. So I went to Africa, and man, I just, that's when God really just was like, mm-hmm. I'm doing something in you. Yeah. And so when I went there, man, I served. Mm-hmm. We had medical clinics during the day, and then we would sing for the Crusades at night. And so I would go to the medical clinics and just mm-hmm. do whatever I could to help. Yeah. And go to take a shower and go sing. And I just wanted to make the most of this opportunity. Mm-hmm. And that trip really opened up a lot of opportunities. Yeah. So before long, I became, they, they hired me part-time to just mm-hmm. help with the worship department. Yeah. And then when the worship director left, mm-hmm. I stepped in and became the worship director of Oral Did you have, University. when you were in Ivory Coast, was there a particular experience that you had with the Lord that just, like, made you realize? I think just being on that trip, just mm-hmm. knowing, like, it was such a supernatural thing how it happened. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I'm going. Yeah. And I went, and I, and I didn't have to pay for anything. It was just a supernatural thing. Yeah. And I was like, God's doing this for a reason. Mm-hmm. And when I got there, just the, the helping the people and just seeing God move. I mean, we saw miracles. We saw yeah. uh, there was a lady that had, she, she came to the medical clinic one morning and had a tumor on her throat wow. the size of about a baseball. And she came to the hospital during the day. And there was nothing we could really do. Yeah. She came to the crusade that night and the tumor was gone. The tumor wow. was gone. I saw it with my own eyes. It was there that day. Nice. She came that night and it was gone. And we saw things like that. And I was wow. like, man, this is incredible. Mm-hmm. I want to be a part of this. Yeah. And so then God just started opening up more and more opportunities wow. for me to lead worship. So you come back to Oklahoma and you're the worship director. I become the worship director. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we... We ended up doing a couple worship albums. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had some students that used to come. Carrie Job was at ORU, oh. Daryl mm-hmm. Evans, uh, wow. some people. Um, and so when I was the director, I just got put it in my heart to do an album that uh, high, that included current students or former students of ORU okay. and do a worship album. That's huge. And so the university supported it, and they said, yeah, let's do it. So we brought Carrie Job in. Mm-hmm. We did an album with her. Daryl Evans was there. And so I was able to help lead with that, produce that. Uh, and we did we did a couple did that a couple of times. We did a couple of albums back in the mid two thousands. <laughs> wow. Um and it was it was incredible to the mm-hmm. experience. And then we yeah. traveled to you know to promote the album and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So you're doing amazing work at or are you what led you to leave? So in two thousand seven. Okay. Uh you know, I was doing a lot of great things for Jesus, mm-hmm. but I there was a lot of things that I was struggling with, mm-hmm. and I didn't have uh, a very good support system. I didn't have a very good accountability uh, in my life, and mm-hmm. so um, I went to a conference. Before you, could you just talk about that for leaders and talk to the yeah, leaders as well? I mean, I uh, I was doing incredible things mm-hmm. for God. Yeah, and but I. I got to where there was just there was just struggles that I had that mm-hmm. you know things habits things that I had picked up you know mm-hmm. from the time that I really wasn't serving God and mm-hmm. I'd done well for, good for a while mm-hmm. and then just kind of find myself in these cycles yeah. of making poor decisions and and um, and I never really thought I will say I never thought like God's okay with this because I'm ministering mm-hmm. I was never one of those people that was like because I'm ministering mm-hmm. and God's using me He must be okay with this I it was miserable yeah and I knew. That that was not what God ha- wanted for me. Yeah. Uh, and so, in 2007, I had just a, a real mm-hmm. life changing encounter with Jesus. Yeah. In 2007, I mean, mm-hmm. changed my life. Yeah. I went to a conference, and at this conference, it was in Sydney, Australia, at Hillsong. Mm-hmm. And I'm at this conference, and everyone that I met from Hillsong, all they talked about was their local church. I mean, I was talking to all the all the people. All the leaders at Hillsong, I, I was able to connect with them and talk with them. And when they were talking, they just talked about their love 
for their church, church. their local church. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, that's what's missing in my life. Mm -hmm. I am not connected to a local church. I'm not covered. I'm not accountable. Mm -hmm. I, and I need that. Yeah. And so I came back to Tulsa. Uh, and three weeks later, I resigned. Hmm. Wow. I resigned. Yeah. Before we move, I want you to pray for the leaders who... Because when you're a leader, you don't you just think about serving, but you don't think about that you need people around you, yeah. over you. Can we just pray for the leaders? Absolutely. And here's what I'll tell you. Uh, God is way more concerned about you being who he's called you to be than mm -hmm. what you can do for him. Yes. Amen. That's good. That's good. Repeat that. He is way more concerned about you being who he's called you to be mm -hmm. than doing what you think he's called you to do. Wow. And there was a time wow. in my life where I was doing things. Mm -hmm for God, mm -hmm. but I was not the person God called me to be. Wow. And God was way more concerned about me becoming who he wanted me to be mm -hmm. than the things I was doing for him. Wow. And so I had to lay down the things I was doing mm -hmm. so that he could work on me to become the person he wanted me to be. Wow. Uh, and so I will pray that. Mm -hmm. God, we just th pray for anyone, Lord, as they're just, they're, they're working for you. And Lord, maybe, maybe they're struggling. Maybe there's things that they're battling with. And God, I just pray that you would just, first of all, let them know that you love them, that you are for them, and that you are committed to them being healthy and them being made whole. And so, God, I just pray that you would send people. If they feel isolated, if they feel alone, I pray that you would send people in their path, God, that they could reach out to, that would be able to speak life and be a sounding board to help them walk through the things that they're battling with and they're struggling with. And Lord, I just pray for a supernatural peace, God, and a grace to just overwhelm them, God, that they would know that they can lay everything down. At any moment, they can turn to you, lay it down, and you will forgive them, and you are able to restore them and put them right in the exact same, right place that you have for them. So Lord, we just bless them, and I pray for, for mentors and people to come into their lives that can speak to them and, and love them and help them walk through these times uh, that they're struggling, and they won't have to feel like they're doing it alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Yes. So you come back and you resign from all of it. Yeah. S quit. <laughs> <laughs> Walked away from all of it. How your wife take that decision? I wasn't married. Oh, you're married. Okay, wasn't yeah, married you can do that at the time. Yeah. So wasn't married, quit. Mm -hmm. uh, and moved back to Virginia. Hmm. Uh, and at the time, my parents were serving at a church uh, in Virginia, Rocky Mount, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And... Um, the founder, Joseph Crandall, had started the church in a Bible college there. And okay. my dad had worked for him when mm -hmm. I was a baby, when I was like four years old, wow. when he first started the school. Mm -hmm. And then while I was at RU, uh, Joe Crandall's son, Phil, had taken the church, mm -hmm. and he had invited my father to come back and work with him at the school again. So when I left ORU, the only place I had to go was home. So I mm -hmm. went to Virginia, and, man, I just... Uh, I submitted to that church, I submitted to that pastor, Phil Crandall, and he taught me the importance of prayer. Uh, he, he was a man of prayer. Mm -hmm. And he, he taught me the importance of making prayer a priority in my life. Okay. Because I was do back at ORU, I was doing all these things, and mm -hmm. I didn't even have a prayer life. Wow. I was, I was living on my gifts. Wow. And I, I wasn't intentional about my prayer life. That's a sermon right there. I mean, I'm just telling you, it's it's the real deal. My wow. ki my gift had taken me to a place that my character hmm. was not ready for. It. Wow. And so I went there and I submitted there, and uh, that's actually where I um, met my wife. She we had known each other, mm -hmm. um, but that's the church she grew up in. Her grandfather's one that started it. Yeah. Uh, and so we met there, and we were able to get married in 2009. Okay. And then we served there as worship leaders for mm -hmm. a little bit. And then God uh, gave us the opportunity to move to Texas mm. um, in 2010 to serve at yeah. a church down in Texas. Okay. Uh, so we did that for a few years. And so mm -hmm. pretty much since we've been married, yeah. so we have been serving the local church. I want to go back to Virginia because yeah. it seemed like that was your refreshing. Oh, yeah. Where you some structure was brought in your life. Yeah. Discipline. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. What... In that time, like, what's the one thing that the Lord taught you that to this day? I know you said prayer, but is there anything else that... Yeah, I mean, there was a lot. There was a whole year Yeah. before I ended up meeting my wife that, I mean, I went from traveling, Yeah. you know, doing albums, mm -hmm. all the things, to 
really obscurity. Yes. You know, I was living with my parents again. Mm-hmm. You know, that has to be in my, like my mid twenties. You know, I moved back in with my parents. A little ego. Yeah, you know, but there. God was just stripping away mm-hmm. the things that were going to hinder me. Yes. And what what I learned is that God loved me so much. Mm-hmm. Just away from me. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, that God loved me so much mm-hmm. that He was willing to take me out of that mm-hmm. and s- send me to a place yeah. where I could heal. True. Because my heart was always, I love God. I yeah. always loved him. And I always wanted to mm-hmm. do something for him. Yeah. And he knew that. So he rescued me. Mm-hmm. And he brought me out of things that on paper seemed like, man, you know, you got these opportunities and this is in front of you and all this. And and I just, I knew that I had to walk away from that because yeah. that wasn't worth it. Amen. That God had something else. And I needed mm-hmm. to go develop and be healed mm-hmm. and be restored yeah. so that I could do what God ultimately called me to do. Wow. So in this time, you go to Texas. Did you lead worship in Texas? Yes. Yeah, so we church? went to Texas. We were worship leaders at, mm-hmm. at uh, uh, Faith Family Church in Victoria, okay. Texas. Pastor Jim and Tamara Graff. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, God used that place to mm-hmm. really strengthen our marriage. We kind of yeah. got away from our, we moved away from our families and mm-hmm. we were there. And God really used them to help us grow yeah. with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... How did you end up up here? Yeah, so we we led worship there. And then we helped start another church in, in Texas. Uh, they sent out somebody from that church to start a church. And we helped him do that. We were worship leaders there. And then in 2016, we kind of were just feeling some burnout. You know, and a lot of it was self-inflicted. You know, not not having good boundaries and things. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we just stepped away, and we and we thought about starting a church, and we would, we weren't ready for that, so that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were just seeking God. We yeah. were just like, God, what do you have for us? And so then we had an opportunity. So we actually left Texas, moved back to Virginia. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> back home. Back home. And we're there for a year, just kind of like regrouping. Mm-hmm. What do we do, God? What do you want us to do? Yeah. And it was very humbling, yeah. you know, because we we didn't know what what to do. Yeah. You now know? we have a family. Now yeah. it's not you. Yeah. And so now we have a. You're yeah. right. We have two kids. Yeah. I'm married, two sons. Yeah. Amazing sons. Yeah. So then we have an opportunity to go back to Texas okay. to do some work, business, like mm-hmm. a business thing business opportunity and we still love god yeah and then this this actually gave us a chance to do a business thing but then also serve in a church that some of my closest friends uh, Mm -hmm. were pastoring in cleveland texas and so we thought you know what let's just do that we'll go and do this business and we'll serve there and we'll just live happily ever after (laughs) you know we'll just love god and we really thought i really thought yeah that i was done working for churches wow i really did I always, I'm not done with God, mm-hmm, just working for but me. just done. And then in 2017, we went home for the holidays for a few weeks, mm-hmm. and God began to stir my heart for ministry again. Okay. And we came back to back to our home in Texas after the holidays, and uh, and we prayed, and we started putting feelers out, and pe- churches started calling for inter- you know wanting me to fly out and things, mm-hmm. and. I realized that I wasn't ready, as ready as I thought. So I was like, yeah. we've got to pump the brakes. Yeah. I was ready. But then a few months later, uh, God connected me with who is now my pastor, Pastor Dean Hawk, mm-hmm. here in Colorado Springs. And we started just kind of following them and, yeah. and looking into them, researching the church. Mm-hmm. And we flew out here, my wife and I. And, uh, man, we just knew that this was, there was something really special yeah. about this place. And so we got here. Uh, we came out, interviewed. They offered us a job. And, I mean, it's Colorado Springs. I know. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so we uh, yeah. we were so excited mm-hmm. and so humbled that yeah. God would still use us. Because when you came here, I was at the church at the time. Yeah. And that's kind of where our paths intertwined. Yeah. And, and this is kind of what I've been waiting for the whole interview to get to this part. Yes. Because what I heard you share, I don't know, two weeks now at the yep. worship thing. Before I even get jump, let me not get ahead of myself. Yeah. Let's start. So you you moved here. Moved here. And what is that journey yeah. like from then to? So 
I, I'll make it quick too. Okay. Uh, we started working with with mm-hmm. Rock Family. We we came here working with Pastor Gene and Kim Hawk. Amazing, mm-hmm. amazing, incredible leaders. Yeah. And God. And just shameless didn't. plug, Dean Hawk. If you're watching this, I'm about to hit you up for this interview. Yeah, <laughs> Pastor Dean. You yeah. Do this. <laughs> yes. Uh, we. It was the, it was just the perfect place. It yeah. Was absolutely, where God intended for us to be. Mm-hmm. And God's just done so much in the last three years. Uh, in our family, in our marriage, in our, in our kids. I mean, it's just incredible. Just incredible yeah. being in the right place with the right culture, with the right mm-hmm. leadership, and it's just been incredible. Yeah. So we've loved it, and uh, mm-hmm. we, you know, we put roots down. We bought a, bought a home here. And, yeah. Um, so we're permanently here. Yeah, we're here. Yeah. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> and uh, we're here. And so mm-hmm. then, uh, so we've been praying. I did the worship, and then I started getting involved with a lot of the creative things, the production, broadcast, all the things that we do at the church. Um, the, the marketing, communications, all those things. Yeah, I started kind of helping with that, um, and things were going really great. And then, um, and they still are. But in January, yeah, finally, so I've been waiting for. Uh, this is uh, really you know last year, two thousand twenty, was yeah. just such a crazy year. Yes, it was. You know, and so we, you know, we did what all the churches do. You know, we mm-hmm. tried to honor the mm-hmm. the shutdown, and we did that for a few weeks, and then we were like, you know. When we were able to open up again, we were like, we're opening again, you mm-hmm. know, and we tried to be sensitive yeah. and support people's decisions and all those things. And, you know, we did we did well. I think we responded pretty well. But in January, um, with all the things that are going on in the world, mm-hmm. especially here in America, um, man, I just, my heart just started, I, there was just a stirring. I can't, and it really started last year. Yeah. Nicole and I, my wife Nicole, we would we would talk about it, and we feel like there's a stirring, and we just didn't know. We would just pray about it, sit on it, and then in January, it just became very um, couldn't ignore it. Yeah, like it was something's happening, something's mm-hmm. shifting. Yeah, in our hearts, and so I don't know if, if you want me to just jump in. Go. Okay. However your legs. Okay. Go. So. Uh, about halfway through the month of January, you know, with all the political things that were going on, I told Nicole, I said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to turn off all the noise. We're, we're not going to watch the news. Mm-hmm. We're not going to, we're just, we're shutting it all off. Yeah. So, and I, I really felt led to lean in and dig in yeah. because God wanted to, to do something. And so I told my wife, I said, we're going to start praying every day. God, give me eyes to see and give me ears to hear what you're saying for our family, what you're saying for our church, what you're saying for our city, and ultimately what you're saying for this nation. I don't, I want you to speak to me. I don't want to listen to the news. I don't want to listen to this person. I want you to show me what do you have for us? What do you want? What do you want for my family? What do you want for this church? What we want to do what you want Mm -hmm. and so god then uh as we and we prayed it every day Mm -hmm. we prayed it every day for and after a few days god began to deal with me and really god began to speak to me that i needed to step it up and he's like brad you need to step it up and i'm like god i i work pretty hard you know what do you mean and god said uh i don't want you to do more i want you to lead more and he said there are people Mm. that have gifts mm. and they're waiting for you to make a place for them. Mm. That will preach right there. Don't he do said, more, lead more. He said, make a place for them. Mm. They they have gifts and they've never, maybe they've never thought about using their gifts for the kingdom. Mm-hmm. Maybe they uh, used to or they were hurt or mm-hmm. something, but there's people that you don't even know about. Yeah. And then God said, everything, this is where he was really got, you yeah. know, in my face and he said Brad everything that you have going on right now you can manage in your own strength Mm. and he said if you can do it in your own strength Mm -hmm. then there's no room for me wow and God said you have limits and you have a capacity Mm -hmm. but I don't Mm. and he said you keep saying if we had this equipment if we had this team if we had this then we could do this and God's like stop it if you will do what I say, mm-hmm. 
then I will resource it. Mm. I will resource it with people, mm-hmm. and I will resource it with finances. So mm-hmm. stop thinking about what you can mm-hmm. do and what you can handle. Mm-hmm. Step into my capacity and watch what I can do. And I, I just was like, I repented. Yeah. And I was like, God, you're so right. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just do yeah. what I can do. Mm-hmm. I want to do what it takes you to do. You have to do it, or it's not going to work. Yes. And so uh, I started praying. Okay, I said, oh, what does that look like? God, what does that look like? What are you asking? What do you need? And so he began to give me ideas. So we started this thing, and I, and I work in the creative area of our church. So we launched this thing called Creative Circles. Okay. And so we opened it up to the whole church, and we said, if you're interested in songwriting, storytelling, testimony videos, uh, worship leading, um, p- poetry, uh, video, lighting, anything creative, we want you to come, and we'll train you. You don't have to know about it. We'll train you. Mm-hmm. And so we just decided to open it up. And, man, people started coming out. I mean, there's a guy, he had been coming since 2019, wow. and he used to play the guitar for a worship team, and he used to travel all over the world playing guitar for leading worship. And he came up to me, and he said, in November, I finally put my hands up. God had been dealing with him. And he said, in November of last year, yeah. God, I'm ready for you to use me. I'm ready for you to use me again. He started picking, and so he picked his guitar back up. Wow. And he'd been coming since 2019. And I finally met him in 2021 when we made a place, and he came and said, I'm ready to serve. Wow. I'm ready to serve. And then we launched a, an outreach at our church called Hugs the Bear, mm-hmm. where we have bears that we give to first responders. They can have them when they respond to a call. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we're, we want to do is we want to ch- write children's stories where the kids interact with first responders. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're sitting there. And this girl, she's, she stands up at this event, and she says, I just moved here. I don't know why I'm here, mm-hmm. but uh, God called me here, and I have a heart to write children's stories. And so I went up to her, and I was like, we need that. So wow. God was like, step into what I want, and I'll resource it. I'll send you the people. Wow. And so it's been one thing after another, one story after another, and people have been coming in. Wow. And so we've just seen it, seen it happen. Mm-hmm. So we started doing that, and that was great for our church and everything. But then... God uh, really took me to um, a, a really just deep place yeah, and began to speak some things to me. Mm-hmm. And so I was just, you know, leaning in and praying. And I just said, God, you know, what, what are you saying for the church, the, the, your church? Yeah. And God began to speak to me that he, he, his heart was broken over the, the state of our church. The, the his church and so I was like God what does that mean what does that look like and uh, and he gave me a he gave me a vision of a river and the river had very distinct river banks and the Lord told me he said the river banks tell the river where to go they tell the river how to operate they tell the river what to do and if you get rid of the river banks then the river overflows into the forest and eventually becomes consumed by the elements around it. And there's no differentiation between the river and the forest. And God said, the river represents my church and the riverbanks represent my word. And he said, my word should be dictating and directing the church on how to operate, how to respond, how to act, how to what to do, and all the things that are going on in this country, the word should be directing the church on how to respond. And God said, people have gotten away from my word. And this is what he told me. He said, on one side of the river, mm-hmm. we have a riverbank that's been dug out because people have now tried to solve spiritual problems with political ideologies. He said, we've tried to place a government ideal in a place that's reserved for him. He is the answer. And we have tried to solve problems with political solutions. And God said, I am the one that can fix it, not the government. So I was like, wow. Then he said, on the other side of the river, He said, we have leaders in the church that are now saying that things that 
in my word I say are evil, leaders in my church are now saying are good. They are calling evil good. And they are aligning themselves with things, not just turning a blind eye to sin, but actually calling sin, not sin. Mm. And he says, so that riverbank is dug out. He said, so my church is now overflowed into culture. And it's hard to tell the difference between my church and culture and society. Wow. Wow. And I said, well, that's a problem. (laughs) Yes. You know? Yes. And so... uh, then he took me to this, but this is the, the good part. Okay. He took me to the story of Nehemiah. Okay. When Nehemiah rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem. Yeah. And if you read the story, it says that there was a time where the builders mm-hmm. had to have a weapon in one hand. Yeah. And a sword in the other. And God spoke to me and he said, I'm extending an invitation to anyone that's willing to pray for eyes to see and ears to hear what I'm saying. What I want to do. Mm. I'm a singing invitation for them to rebuild my church. Mm. But they're going to have to defend my word. Because I'm rebuilding my church within the confines of my word. My word will dictate and direct my mm. church how to operate. Mm. And so those that are willing to, to surrender, those that are willing to be a part of it, have to be willing to build it, but at the same time defend it because my word is under attack. Mm. people don't like the word of God. They don't like truth. They don't like absolutes. Mm-hmm. The Bible is the final authority. Yes. It just is. Mm-hmm. Right? 100% true. So we have to build the church yeah. on the word of God. And that's what God wants to do. And he wants people that are willing to stand up and mm-hmm. say, the Bible says what it says, mm-hmm. and we do what the Bible says. Amen. Because it's God's word. Amen. And that's how we're going to be the church. Wow. To be the church God's called us to be, mm-hmm. look at the Bible. Those are the riverbanks. Those are the confines mm-hmm. that direct the church where to go. Wow. And so I'm excited yeah. because I, I've spoken to people across the country. Some A friend down in Orlando who's pastors of church. Mm-hmm. Uh, a friend up in Michigan, Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. And God is saying some of the same things. In Virginia, yeah. I just talked to a guy the other day. The same things. Wow. That's because amazing. God is extending an invitation yeah. to people that are willing to Rebuild the church and stand on mm-hmm. the word of God. Because that's the church is supposed to be built on the word of God. What did what Jesus say to Peter was on this rock I'll build my church. The rock of who he is. Yep, and here's the thing. The the God God what God's doing right now in the earth is not a movement. Mm-hmm. What God is doing in the earth right now is an establishment. Could you sep- uh, define the two? Yes, sep- so a movement is something that can go away. Yeah. It can stop. Mm-hmm. And it needs the people. Like a fad. Right? Mm-hmm. But it est- when it's established, mm-hmm. it's not going anywhere. Yeah. It's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And God's establishing his kingdom. Yeah. That's what he's doing. Mm-hmm. So it's not a movement of God. It's an establishment of God. The verse that keeps coming to mind is the rock that the builders rejected yeah. has become the cornerstone. Come on. And it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere because God's establishing his kingdom. Mm-hmm. And he's inviting us to be a part of it. Yeah. So you how know? is this revelation just not... Because you've already shared how it's changed how you lead the church. Personally, at home, with your kids. Uh, it's changed every part of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, it's changed every part of my life. Amen. Because the, the thing is, people... Uh, People want revival. Yes. People want an authentic Mm -hmm. move of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But it costs you something. And that's the truth. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about salvation by works. Mm -hmm. But I am talking about consecration. Yes. And that's been one of the things that God is like he he is he's asking us to lay down things that consume time and fill it and let him fill it up with him with himself mm-hmm. so um you know there's just there's a a seriousness there's an intentionality yeah. to what we're willing to lay down and say God I'm laying this down and mm-hmm. because I want you to come and fill this space I'm mm-hmm. creating this space mm-hmm. for you because I want what you have yeah and I want all of it Mm-hmm. And I know if I'm doing this and I'm worried about this, that's a space that you can't 
come to mm-hmm. because it's full of something else. Mm-hmm. So I'm laying it down. Wow. And so it's mm-hmm. it is it's affected wow. it's affected mm-hmm. you know just the things that we say yes to the things yeah. that we do yeah um, and here's the thing I want to yeah. say it's what God asks of us of me yes so I'm not going to project on you mm-hmm. what God's ask of me mm-hmm. all I'm going to do is ask you to have the conversation what is He asking of you. Yeah. That's very wise. But I'm not going to tell you that you have to do everything God's telling me to do. Yes. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's legalism. Mm-hmm. That's me trying to project on you. To, mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, and that's why it's because that's, uh, a lot of people make that mistake because God told me to do it like this. You got to do it. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, that's not always the case. There yeah. might be something that God wants me to lay down because he wants to do th- what he wants to do through me mm-hmm. that you don't have to lay down. Yes. You don't have to give that up. Mm-hmm. And so, if I start holding you accountable to that, you mm-hmm. might not even have the grace to do it. True. That's the key right there. Because God's going to give you the grace mm-hmm. to do what he's called you to do. Yeah. As we wrap up here, I want, I mean, we pray every single time. And I don't want to miss another opportunity for prayer here, for consecration. Because regardless of whatever God is leading you, consecration to him is mandatory throughout the world. Absolutely. And I want you to pray for two things. For everybody to to be consecrated to the Lord, and also for people who are listening to this to receive what you just shared, because that is, to me anyway, it's amazing. And I pray that the people who are watching, they open their hearts up to sure. receive that. I love it. Father, we just thank you that you love us. We thank you that you have chosen us to be alive right now in this moment of time. Lord, all the things that are going on in the world, and God, you have, uh, you're allowing us to be a part of the solution, to be the part of the the extension of your hands and feet and your love and to paint the picture of who Jesus is and who you are to the world. And so, God, we don't take that lightly. We don't take that for granted. Lord, it's an honor for us that you've chosen us to be a part of this time right now, what you're doing in the earth. And so I just pray for everyone that's watching, everyone that's listening, Lord, that they would just be um, overwhelmed with your presence, Lord, that you would invade every part of their lives. God, just like you have with us, you you've showed, you showed started showing us areas of our lives that we had not surrendered to you, that we were still holding on to. We were still trying to control. And you asked us to, to let go so you could do something better. And God, I pray that you would do that for people that are listening. Show them the areas that you want to invade, that you're wanting to, uh, to interject yourself and give them the grace to lay that stuff down so you can move in and do something incredible in their hearts and in their lives. And Lord, I just pray that, um, Lord, that we would all be willing to ask the question, God, what are, you, uh, what are you asking of me? What do I need to lay down? We want everything. You paid a price, a, a great price, a heavy price for everything that's made available to us. And we don't want to take it for granted. So God, I pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to see anything in our lives, God, that's hindering your access to us. We have unlimited access to you, but we know that sin and things can hinder your access to us. And so God, I pray that you would open our eyes to those things and give us the grace to lay them down and the strength to walk away from them and Lord, to surrender them to you and Lord, to receive your grace, which is your ability in us to live over sin power over sin, power over death, power over the, the, the strongholds and the guilt and the shame that the enemy tries to use to separate us from you. God, you have given us grace to live above that. And so I just pray that for every person that's watching, Lord, that they would, that their eyes would be open to your love, to your grace, and Lord, that they would surrender everything that they have to you and invite you to come and be a part of every part of their lives. And Lord, they would begin to see that you can do much better in every area than we can do on our own. And so, God, we love you. We honor you. We thank you that you've chosen us. And we don't take it for granted. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much, bro. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It's thank an honor. You. I am so grateful. It's like, an yeah, honor. I don't think you understand how grateful I am no. right now. I, I, you don't understand how grateful I am. <laughs> I really do appreciate it, man. Yeah. You know, when God lays something on your heart, you know, mm-hmm. you just kind of... yeah. Who do I share this with? You know, and mm-hmm. and I just I told God I said if you're if you're sharing if you're giving me things, mm-hmm. I want you to open doors. Yeah, you know, and so mm-hmm. you'll lead people, and so yeah. I just appreciate you being obedient and having me come, man. It's an honor. <laughs> Thank you. So remember, everybody, we all have a story. What's your story? Goodbye.
Hey, you made it till the end. Thank you for tuning in and watching this amazing interview. If you want to get a hold of Emanuela, you can do so on social media. There's also a blog where you can read some of his writings. God bless you. And remember, everybody has a story. What's your story?